If there's only one thing you can learn from the life of Eiji Aonuma, let it be this. It's never too late to reinvent yourself. Aonuma entered the industry with almost no knowledge of video games, but has grown into a strong leader at the helm of one of Nintendo's biggest franchises. His work in the industry has left a massive imprint on action-adventure games, and has influenced multiple generations of developers. This is how a woodworker with no experience with gaming went to reinvent the industry's most storied fantasy franchise more than once. This is A.G. Aonuma. Eiji Onizuka was born on March 16, 1963 in the Nagano Prefecture of Japan. He would later change his name to Eiji Aonuma around the turn of the millennium after getting married. Aonuma's grandfather and uncle were carpenters, and their family lived near a carpentry shop. Because of this, Aonuma grew up watching people create things with their hands, which had a huge influence on his worldview and work ethic. Aonuma didn't play video games growing up, and his parents never bought him toys. This meant that Aonuma had to make toys of his own, picking up branches that fell from trees and nailing them together to create new playthings. In the 1980s, Aonuma attended the Tokyo National University of Fine Arts and Music, where he realized he wasn't gifted at drawing or coloring. Despite being told that he had no artistic talents, Aonuma found his passion in his family's roots. Woodcrafting he shifted his focus to woodwork, and in particular Karakuri puppets, a traditional Japanese mechanical puppet made for entertainment, especially at parties. The puppets usually performed simple actions through the use of levers and gears, with one common Karakuri puppet serving tea when teacups are placed on the doll. In particular, Aonuma has stated he made Karakuri puppets that would appear to play music once they were wound up, but wooden puppets would not be the creations that defined Aonuma's career. Because of his inexperience with video games, Aonuma only had a casual knowledge of the industry. However, after graduating from Tokyo National University in 1988, Aonuma noticed the artwork and graphic design of Yoichi Kotabe. A fellow graduate of Tokyo National, Kotabe had provided illustrations for the Super Mario series and would later contribute to the Pokemon franchise. Aonuma met with Kotabe, who agreed to set up an interview for Aonuma at Nintendo with a man named Shigeru Miyamoto. Reflecting on the interview, Aonuma thinks his Karakuri puppets made an impact on Miyamoto, who also ran a theater of dolls. Regardless, Aonuma impressed Miyamoto, and was hired as a graphic designer at Nintendo's R&D 2 department the same year. Interestingly, Aonuma was not formally introduced to games until after he'd already applied for this position at Nintendo. His girlfriend at the time suggested Aonuma play the first Dragon Quest game, which he could not put down and sometimes skipped sleep to play. She also introduced Aonuma to the Portopia serial murder case on the PC-8801. Though he only developed graphics when he joined the Nintendo, the more Aonuma worked on games, the more he began to appreciate the medium. One of the first titles Aonuma is credited on is NES Open Tournament Golf, a title he worked on under Masayuki Uemura, the father of the Famicom. Aonuma also helped create sprites for both Mario and Peach during his early years at Nintendo. During this period, Aonuma naturally began playing through a wide range of Nintendo titles, including the first Legend of Zelda. The game frustrated Aonuma, who said at GDC, At the time, I didn't have much experience playing games. I was particularly bad at playing games that required quick reflexes. Instead, his interest shifted more towards text-based games, or ones that focused on puzzle solving instead of action. Aonuma enjoyed reading stories and felt that games that allowed players to participate in their stories could bring joy to many gamers. In 1991, just three years after Aonuma joined the company, Nintendo would release The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past for the Super Famicom. This game had a huge impact on Aonuma's philosophy regarding games and game design. He later reflected on his experience with A Link to the Past during his 2004 GDC talk, explaining that the title incorporated many basic actions that were completely unrelated to battling enemies. These included cutting grass to find secrets, lifting stones to search underneath them, and finding keys to open doors and dungeons. Aonuma felt the same sort of progression in those non-combative actions as he did inputting commands in text-based adventure games. He also felt that the real-time nature of A Link to the Past's gameplay offered superior feelings of control. When speaking about getting inspiration from games he didn't work on, Aonuma told Eurogamer, I don't look at what's happening in the game, but how it made me feel. What in the game moved me, and how can I bring out those same emotions in players who play my games? My intent isn't to copy them, but those are things that stay with you as a player. Aonuma was deeply impressed with A Link to the Past, and wanted to create a game that would live up to the standards that it set. He would get his chance with the title Marvelous, Another Treasure Island. Aonuma's directorial debut released for the Super Famicom on October 26, 1996. 
Marvelous had a rocky development cycle, initially envisioned for the cancelled Super Famicom CD peripheral. Nintendo also originally partnered with the entertainment studio Kyoto Animation to create an animated sequence for the title, but this had to be cut when Marvelous changed format from CD to cartridge. Additionally, Anuma's team developed two Marvelous titles for the Super Famicom's The Teleview service before Another Treasure Island was physically released. The two titles, B.S. Marvelous Time Athletics and B.S. Marvelous Camp Arnold, were prequels to Another Treasure Island and were broadcast to the Satellaview service in January and November of 1996, respectively. Marvelous Another Treasure Island was released far enough into the Super Nintendo's lifespan that the Nintendo 64 was already on the market. Because of this, Nintendo did not want to invest in translating the title for the West, resulting in the game being region-locked to Japan. Still, the gameplay of Marvelous would fulfill Anuma's desire to create a game like Link to the Past, based on puzzles and texts and built on the same engine. Unlike A Link to the Past, Marvelous featured three playable characters and gave players more options when interacting with objects. A sequel was briefly considered for the Nintendo 64, but the series never continued, as Anuma had a bigger role to play in another of Nintendo's franchises. Despite its setbacks, Miyamoto was impressed with Marvelous and Aonuma's work on it, and invited Aonuma to work on the new Zelda game in development for the Nintendo 64. Miyamoto had seen how much A Link to the Past inspired Marvelous, and reportedly thought that if Aonuma wanted to make games similar to Zelda, he might as well work with the main Zelda team at Nintendo Entertainment Analysis and Development. Though this Zelda game was originally envisioned as a launch title for the Nintendo 64, it had an unusually long development cycle and had to be reworked numerous times. The game had an interesting workflow, with several directors who were all in charge of certain portions of the game. Anuma contributed designs for various temples and areas, including what would become its infamous Water Temple. Eventually, he also worked on several gameplay systems that became integrated into the dungeons. For example, Anuma decided that each dungeon should have an overarching theme. For the Force Temple, it was chasing around a set of Poe sisters. For Jabu Jabu's belly, it was rescuing and guiding the Zora Princess. Anuma also worked on enemy designs for these dungeons, ironic considering that combat turned him off from the original Zelda. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was released in November of 1998, to near universal acclaim, partially because of Anuma's work on the title's dungeons. Many of the game's dungeon designs have remained iconic parts of the series, some being remembered fondly and one or two attracting a more notorious reputation. Aonuma was happy with the team's work on Ocarina, and felt that they could hit even greater heights with their next game, even if they would face new challenges. He later explained in an interview that, The atmosphere that we could set a higher goal because we had done a good job with The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was the driving force for making Majora's Mask. I still think we were lucky that we could actually achieve our goal even though we started off unprepared. Despite Onuma's optimism, Nintendo and Miyamoto wondered how they could follow the success of a massive game like Ocarina of Time. It was decided that the next Zelda game would reuse the same engine as Ocarina of Time, since a significant amount of work and resources went into its development. Initially, Miyamoto instructed the Zelda team to begin remixing the game's dungeon in a new version that would be called Ura Zelda, or Another Zelda. Onuma, however, was against this idea and instead wanted to make a full-fledged sequel. Two teams began working on the separate products, with Aonuma leading a project called Zelda Gaiden, or Zelda Side Story. While he was originally the title's sole supervising director, Aonuma was uneasy with this responsibility and asked Yoshiaki Koizumi to join him as a co-director. Koizumi agreed, but only on the condition that he be allowed to do whatever he wanted with the game. The new title was developed by much of the same staff as Ocarina of Time, and reused several assets from that game, allowing development to proceed quickly and efficiently. In the end, it took this smaller team only one year to complete what would become The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, a feat Aonuma does not believe he could achieve again. Though it wouldn't go on to sell as many copies as its predecessor, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask was still a massive success and was similarly universally acclaimed. Game Informer went as far as to call it, without question, the finest adventure the N64 had to offer. Critics and players praised the title's unique and unsettling tone, and thought the time loop gameplay system made it the most unique Zelda game to date. Due to the incredible success of Majora's Mask, Aonuma was tasked with continuing the Zelda franchise, overseeing future entries in the series. In addition to this professional advancement, Aonuma's personal life also changed during this period. Before work on Majora's Mask was completed, he would be married, and shortly after its release, Aonuma's son was born. Before development of Majora's Mask was completed, Nintendo knew the next Zelda game would release on the Nintendo 64's successor, the GameCube. Several experiments were done with the hardware to decide a new direction for the Zelda series, including a realistic demo that was shown at Space World 2000 featuring Link fighting Ganondorf. 
Though the clip resonated with many fans, it was hastily put together and didn't excite the Zelda team. Anuma even hated the realistic demo, saying, I thought, no, this isn't Zelda. This isn't Zelda at all. I felt like this wasn't what I imagined Zelda to be. It wasn't the Zelda I wanted to make. That video clip didn't contain any big surprises. There wasn't any type of revelation going on. It was more like a continuation of the previous version. The staff began looking for a new direction, and one day, artist Yoshiki Haruhana drew Link in a cartoonish style. This design would chart a new course for the Zelda team. The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker was revealed to the public at Space World 2001, but to mixed responses from fans. The harsh initial reaction came as a surprise to Aonuma, as many longtime fans felt Nintendo was abandoning them to appeal more to children. Despite this, when The Wind Waker was released, the game received widespread critical acclaim. Critics praised the title's fluid gameplay and excellent level design, and positively compared the cel shaded art direction to the works of Disney and Hayao Miyazaki. Regardless, fans remained divided on the look, and the title sold considerably less than Ocarina of Time. Nintendo of America attributed the weaker sales to the art style, while Nintendo of Japan believed a general decline in Japanese interest in video games negatively impacted The Wind Waker. Initially, a direct sequel to The Wind Waker was put into development. However, these plans were scrapped after the mixed reactions. This devastated Aonuma, who briefly considered leaving the Zelda series altogether. He decided the next game should cater more to the North American market, and pitched a new game that would act as a continuation of Ocarina of Time. Miyamoto was hesitant about just changing the graphical presentation, and suggested that Aonuma work on concepts that were cut from Ocarina of Time, such as fighting on horseback. Anuma and his team began working to create realistic horseback riding, and completed the feature in just four months. Shortly afterwards, what would become The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess was revealed at E3 2004 to possibly the best reception a Zelda title has ever had. Similar to previous games like A Link to the Past and Ocarina of Time, it was decided to include both a light world and dark world into Twilight Princess. Around this time, Anuma had a dream about a wolf locked into a cage, and was inspired to add Wolf Link to the game to counterbalance the abilities of Human Link. Despite this, Twilight Princess had a troubled development. Anuma was also working as a supervisor on both the Minish Cap and Phantom Hourglass, and when he returned to check in on the Twilight Princess team, he found them struggling to make the gameplay satisfying. During this period, Aonuma was shown the motion control hardware from the Nintendo Wii, and thought that pointing at the screen might be well suited for shooting arrows. Anuma decided to delay Twilight Princess for a year so his team could continue to polish up its gameplay, as well as to incorporate motion controls for a Wii port. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess was released for the GameCube and as a launch title for the Wii in late 2006, to massive critical and commercial success. Between the two versions, Twilight Princess sold 8.85 million copies, more than even Ocarina of Time. After the success of Twilight Princess, Anuma was promoted to the role of producer for the Zelda series, and would eventually take up the position of supervisor for the franchise. He had previously overseen the Zelda franchise's expansions into crossovers, including Soul Calibur 2, and provided support for both Super Smash Bros. Melee and Brawl. Interestingly, Aonuma was also a contributing factor for Smash Bros. series director Masahiro Sakurai to return to the franchise. He told Sakurai that the Smash Bros. series would probably end if Sakurai didn't contribute his skill and expertise to Brawl. In his new supervisory role for the Zelda series, Aonuma oversaw remakes of both Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask for the Nintendo 3DS, and then later HD remasters of Wind Waker and Twilight Princess. However, the first new home console Zelda game Aonuma oversaw would have more mixed results than past Zelda titles. Development on a new Zelda game for the Wii began in late 2006, and Twilight Princess was used by the team as a starting point. Anuma believed that Nintendo hadn't fully realized the goal of creating a vast, realistic world with Twilight Princess, and wanted to make a game as memorable as Ocarina of Time. The company originally estimated that it would take just three years to make this game, but unexpected difficulties extended that timeline to five years. The game incorporated the Wii Motion Plus peripheral, which allowed for more one-to-one -one control of Link by the player. Though Aonuma was originally enthusiastic about incorporating Wii Motion Plus, the team had difficulty implementing it and he considered dropping it altogether. The team would later borrow technology from the developers of Wii Sports Resort so they could better include sword play for the new Zelda game. Despite the troubles, The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword was released in November of 2011. Though the game did receive critical acclaim, it sold fewer than half as many copies as Twilight Princess. Additionally, some critics and many fans felt that Skyward Sword was far too linear, and relied too heavily on traditional Zelda elements. Many players also had difficulty with Skyward Sword's motion controls, and felt like the game was holding their hand. 
This feedback was important to Aonuma, who later told Kotaku, When we created Skyward Sword, I really felt the need to make sure that everyone playing the game understood it, and I kinda front-loaded all that in Skyward Sword. And it doesn't really help to get that information when you don't know what to do with it. So, that was a real learning experience for me. Another comment from fans was that they wanted to explore the areas between Skyward Sword's segmented maps. Because of this, Anuma decided that the next game in the franchise should feature a large interconnected world that would rethink many of Zelda's conventions, and take inspiration from open-world RPGs like The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. It was also decided to include voiceovers during cutscenes, a first for the franchise. The gamble to completely reinvent the Zelda franchise paid off, as The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was released on March 3, 2017 to massive critical and commercial acclaim. It is often cited as one of the best games of all time, and has sold over 15 million copies. It wasn't just a good change for the game, but for the man as well. Anuma has said that working on Breath of the Wild was the most fun he's ever had making a game. He told Game Informer, The people who made this game didn't have troubled faces. They were smiling the whole time they worked on it. At the start of development with all the new things we were doing, I definitely was worried. I had a worried face. As I saw the staff put it together, that concern started to go away. We were doing challenging new things, but we always did them with a smile. I don't think I've experienced that before. Eiji Onuma's role as a guiding hand for the Zelda franchise has reinvented that series in numerous ways, providing unique forms of storytelling, striking visual styles, and new ways for players to solve problems. In 2019, Aonuma was again promoted to the Deputy General Manager of Nintendo's Entertainment, Planning, and Development Division, where he oversaw the remake of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening and is currently overseeing work on Breath of the Wild's sequel. All of this from a woodcarver who had little experience with video games before applying for a job in the business. Aonuma has previously joked about surpassing his colleague and friend Shigeru Miyamoto as a titan in the gaming industry, but Aonuma has already done more than enough to earn himself the title of a legend. Did you also know that Nintendo held a contest to see who could beat Link's Awakening first on a cross-country train ride, or that Reggie Fils-Aimé got his start marketing pizza? For more facts, check out our videos on Link's Awakening and Reggie.